And also, I'll just mention that a lot of the readings for today um, are ones that Martin DiMaggio, uh, who also leads services here, he, he wrote a lot of these. Also have one I pulled back from uh, William Thompson, the founder of our community, and I, one of my favorites. So I just want to mention those. So to get us started, we have our opening song, which is Hine Mato. Who would like, would someone like to read the English on, on this? I can read it. Okay. <clears throat> How good are the dwellings where we gather, serene and vibrant as the gardens by the river, the aloes and the pleasant cedar trees beside the water, Behold how good and pleasant it is for people to dwell together in harmony. Let us sing. Ine matovu manahim shevet amim gam yalakad. Ine matovu manahim shevet amim gam yalakad. Ine matovu and who would like to read uh, the English side on that? And we, humanity, choose to keep a day of rest as an agreement for all time. For in six days we work, and on the seventh we cease from work and are refreshed. Thank you. Veshromrim benehadam et hashabat Lasot et hashabat le dorotum berito laham Veshomrim benehadam et hashabat Lasot et hashabat le dorotum berito laham Kishet Kisheshet yami masu melaka Pasu Malaka Veshomrim Benehadam Veshomrim Benehadam Mehet Hashahabat Lasot et Hashahabat Leturotum Burvito Holam Veshomrim Benehadam Met Hashahabat Met Hashahabat Lehesot et Hashabat Veshomrim Benehadamehet <laughs> La sot et hashahabad le dorotam berritoholam. And we now come to the Barku. And for this, our tradition is for a moment, we're going to stop the screen share because I invite you to take a look at the other people that have the cameras on on, on the Zoom. And as you as you take a look at them, to take a moment to imagine these people filled with happiness and joy. So I'm going to take a moment to look at the other people. And some of you are already filled with happiness and joy. You don't even have to imagine it. And all the places around the world that we are this morning. And now you're invited, if, you, if, if, if you're able to, to stand. Bless the community which blesses us. Blesses the community which is blesses forever and ever. Barku et hakal hamevarak, baruch hakal hamevarak, hamevarak, leolam va'ed. And now we come to our version of the Shema. Who would like to, to read this? Oh. 
I can read this one too. Thank you. <clears throat> Listen, Israel, our people are one. Humanity is one. Let us work together to improve this world. Shema Yisrael Echad Ahamenu Ahadam Mekad Kulanu Navo Latakein Etaholam Haze. Please be seated. And let us love our fellow as ourselves with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our might. And let these words be upon our hearts. Impressing them upon our children, reciting them when we stay at home and when we go out. When we lie down and when we get up, binding them as signs in our hand, serving as a symbol on our forehead, inscribing them on the doorpost of our homes. This we believe to be true. Humankind is capable of redeeming itself from its troubles. Through our efforts, we heal disease, feed the hungry, lift up and fr free the downtrodden. We can achieve liberation through reason, compassion, and working together with trust in one another with faith of a better future for all. Blessed is the light in humanity with which we redeem the world. And now we come to something, this is something that William put together, I hadn't done this in a few services, but I, I was kind of missing it, so I wanted to do it again this morning. This was um, a meditation inspired by the Amidah, well, yeah, and the, 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 the center part of the service. So my encouragement is that you might want to consider uh, for a moment, if you feel more comfortable in a meditative space of turning off your camera, closing your eyes, these are all, all whatever makes you feel more comfortable. But we'll we'll take our time with this. It'll take just a few minutes, but it's a time to kind of ground ourselves and to center ourselves as we're coming into the rest of the service. Also, this is a breath meditation. However, everyone kind of breathes at different speeds. So feel free. If you want to follow the breath instructions I'm giving, great. If you want to do your own thing, that's fine, too. Breathing in, I take breath into myself. Breathing out, I join the web of being. Breathing in, I rest in the present. Breathing out, I am part of past and future. Breathing in, I honor the shrine of my body. Breathing out, I honor the shrine of the cosmos. Breathing in, presence fills me. Breathing out, presence enfolds me. Breathing in, I witness what is broken. Breathing out, I bow to what is perfect. Breathing in, I offer gratitude for what is. Breathing out, I accept all that changes. Breathing in, I pray for peace for myself. Breathing out, I pray for peace for all beings. We'll pause for a moment of silent reflection. So this morning for our Devar Torah, we're going to be talking, I'm going to be sharing a little bit about the story of Shifra and Pua, the midwives who defied Pharaoh. And so for this, I'm going to pull up the text in Sepharia. And I thought for our, for our, for our study, we would go ahead and read Exodus chapter 1 which contains the story, but also gives a little bit of context for what is right before it. So let's see. Uh, see how far. So would someone like to read the English for verses one to five? 
You'll need to share your screen again, James. Oh, of course, yeah. That would help. So you're, oh, no, no, you had the mute one. I was going to say you need, need a cup that says share screen. <laughs> okay, so who would like to read verses one to five in English? I will. Okay. These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each coming with his household. Reuben, Shimon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zerlon, and Benjamin. Don and Naphtali, God and Asher. The total number of persons that were of Jacob's issue came to 70, Joseph being already in Egypt. And why don't you go ahead and read two more verses? Joseph died and all his brothers and all that generation. But the Israelites were fertile and prolific. They multiplied and increased very greatly so that the land was filled with them. A new so king... Oh, go ahead. A new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Look, the Israelite people are much too numerous for us. Let us deal shrewdly with them, so they may not increase. Otherwise, in the event of war, they may join our enemies in fighting against us and rise from the ground. So I mentioned before we go in a little bit of context, right before this, uh, at, the, at the tail end of the book of Genesis, remember the saga, the story of, of uh, the sons of Jacob, and when they sold um, sold uh, Joseph into slavery, he ended up making his way to Egypt, where he, through, through a very uh, interesting set of circumstances, some people go as far as to say the book the story of joseph is really the first um novella we have or it's really it's really an almost a self-contained unit but the story of joseph of how he found his way out of slavery to being number two in all of the empire of egypt later though when there's a famine back in the land of canaan the um, sons of jacob made their way to egypt didn't know of course joseph who joseph was they came there seek, um, seeking food, and there is a story then of how that all came to be, story of reconciliation. There's a lot of twists and turns, not going to go into the story today. The important thing is, is that what ended up happening was these this family ended up settling in the land of Egypt um, as a result of this. Now, history tells us that the story is um, more complicated and may not have even happened. Uh, scholars disagree a lot about whether there was actually an exodus or not. And the, the, frankly, the consensus opinion until fairly recently was in the academic world that there was not actually, wasn't it? There, there wasn't an exodus. And there's some, some big issues, most notably the lack of archaeological evidence of this level of a migration. More recently, though, there's been some good arguments made, and I'm kind of persuaded by these arguments, that there was an exodus, but it was much, much smaller than the Bible depicts. Um, and some of the arguments for this is some of the linguistic evidence um, in, in the text. There's a well, That's a whole discussion for another day. The important thing in, t in hearing this story, though, is to say is that while it is possibly rooted in historical events, there's no doubt that there's a lot of folklore, there's legend, there's oral history on top of it. And so in in reading these stories, it's not just reading dry history, but we're looking at what kinds of points were the compilers of this text? What were they seeking to, to inspire future generations of Israelites and later Jews? What do we make of it? Uh, because these are, like all ancient stories, these are stories intended to provide meaning, to help us sort through things. Okay, with that context said, let's go back to our text now. So, they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor, and they built garrison cities for Pharaoh, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they were oppressed, the more they increased and spread out so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. 
The Egyptians ruthlessly imposed upon the Israelites the various labors that they made them perform. Ruthlessly, they made life bitter for them with harsh labor at mortar and bricks and with all sorts of tasks in the field. And then that brings us to the, to our main part of the story today. The king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua. Before we go on, in Hebrew, um, it's not 100% clear whether it's Hebrew midwives or midwives to the Hebrews. In other words, were these midwives Hebrew women who served other Hebrew women? Or were they Egyptian women who served Hebrew women? We really don't know. Um, ancient commentators uh, had a, a variety of opinions on this. And, to, and up until to, to today, it's the same thing. We really don't know. In either case, um, I think the, the bravery of these two women is really important. Also, note who's named here, the midwives. Who is not named? The king of Egypt. Pharaoh does not get named. The midwives do. So anyway, the Pharaoh spoke to the Hebrew midwives, Shephra and Pua, and sang, When you deliver the Hebrew women, look at the birth stool. If it is a boy, kill him. If it is a girl, let her live. The midwives, fearing God, did not do as the king of Egypt had told them. They let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this thing, letting the boys live? The midwife said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, they are vigorous. Before the midwife can come to them, they have given birth. And God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and increased greatly. And God established households for the midwives because they feared God. Then Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, every boy that is born you shall throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. Let me turn off screen share for a second. Before I go on, Skip, you had your hand up. Yes, um, <clears throat> I thought I'd share something kind of interesting. I won't I won't share the entirety of uh, what was um, uh, given, but I attended um, the Reconstructionist Havara that uh, that I, I go to here. Um, and uh, the Devar Torah obviously was about these verses, and in that verse that it said that the you know the midwives were telling the uh, the Pharaoh that um, the the reason why they you know they give birth um, before they can you know kill the baby is because um, you know it says that they're vigorous, but the word there in Hebrew is actually chayot and that actually translates um, to like like an animal or like you know savage, and some people um, uh, you know ask the question, why would uh, the pharaoh believe the midwives? And you know uh, you posit that they might have been Egyptian women being midwives to the Hebrews, and and that might explain it, but also. Uh, the the explanation that was offered uh, last night at the service was that Pharaoh had such contempt for the Hebrews and saw them as as lesser than as hayot as animals, and so when the midwives said said that to him, he was like, "Oh, okay, well that makes sense because they are like animals," and so he didn't question it; he just believed them, um, even though they were misleading him in order to preserve the lives of those Hebrew boys. Mm. And the there was much more shared about viewing other people as hayot, as as animals, in order to dehumanize them. Um and it was it was a really beautiful service, but mm. I just wanted to share I just wanted to share that insight, that the, at least that partial insight that was given at the at uh, at the service. Oh thank you, Skip. That's very, very spot on and appropriate. Um actually that which what they shared there really made me think of something, and that is the way that issues of childbirth and slavery have always been an issue. And one of the things I'm thinking about in this country, um, if you look at the history of gynecology in the United States, one of the tragic things is that a lot of the 
early research was done on enslaved women. Um, and there's quite a bit of the scholar early scholarship in gynecology was done, but the problem was was often done in very rural dehumanizing kinds of ways. Um, and that's a part of medical history that doesn't get talked about a great deal. Well, in this story, you know, the Jewish people have taken inspiration from this story from in, in many ways over the centuries, but especially about the concept of conscientious objection. Now, we think of conscientious objection most commonly in the context of war, and that's my, my knowledge of it is from I my my main job is I work as an attorney. And as an attorney, most of my work is with U.S. service members who are wanting out, who are who are struggling with issues of conscience, uh, but or for a variety of other reasons. But often it is because of conscience. And sometimes they go through the process of actually being recognized as conscientious objectors. Um, in the context, of course, we're most familiar with the context of a draft. If a draft is called, there's a process where a person can apply to be recognized as a CO. And then if one gets that status, they do alternative service. But there's also under U.S. law provisions for if you're already in the military and you have a change of conscience, a process that a service member could go through to have the status recognized and eventually to be discharged out or to do non-combatant service. And I've had a lot of clients over the years I've worked through in this process, some who have been able to be successfully discharged, others due to circumstances often outside their control, um, that, for instance, if they had their change of conscience shortly before deployment, they ended up instead of there was not time to go through the process. So they instead ended up refusing to obey orders and going to prison for it in some cases. Um, and so this is an issue that's really pressing on my mind a lot. And a lot of it goes back to really Shifram Pua, I would argue, are really one of the earliest known examples in world history of conscience objection because they were given the order by the Pharaoh. They were told very clearly what they were to do. But it says in the text that they, because they feared God, because they had this sense of, of, uh, of uh, morality, and again, in this case, it's because of, of the deity, but it could be based upon other grounds as well that they defied the Pharaoh, they broke the rules. Now, the biblical text shows that everything worked out for them. It doesn't always work out that way. Um, and oftentimes those who engage in act, act conscience objection often are misunderstood and often things don't go well for them. And this morning, just as a conversation starter to lead us into a conversation about where these ideas of conscience, conscience objection go, I'm gonna share a pretty controversial example of this, but I'm sharing it uh, for a few reasons. One is that it's a Jewish, a very present Jewish context, but also because it raises challenging questions, especially about the tensions between individual conscience and collective norms. So let me share a screen for this. Um, I'm going to share just a little bit about this, not in detail, but it's about a case right now in Israel. If I can... This, this story is from 972 Magazine, but it's written about elsewhere. And the, the headline is, I refuse to take part in a revenge war. Israel jails teen for opposing army draft. Tal Mitnick is the first Israeli conscience objector to be imprisoned since October 7th. He explains why the current war has only reaffirmed his convictions. Um, fascinating story. There's a lot more written about Tal and other places. Um, one is I would mention that Tal also is part of a long, there's actually over the last decade or so, there have been quite a few Israeli conscient objectors. And unfortunately in Israel, very few people are granted the legal status. Um, generally only ultra-Orthodox will ever be approved, particularly if you're citing religious reasons. And so what most often happens, as has happened to Tal, is they get sent to prison. Um, Tao's so far been given a 30 day jail sentence. Um, what typically happens in Israel is you that a young person will be given several. They'll be given 30 days told do your do, now go to your military duties. If you refuse, they'll send you back to jail for another two or three stints. And then eventually they'll then discharge you from the army for mental health grounds uh, rather than ever recognizing the issue of conscience. Now, I bring up the example, though, of Tao, and I, and I realize as a community, we, we have probably a wide variety of views about Israel, about the war going on. I'm not, not asking us all to have 
free or the positive position or like that on that. But what I am saying is that I think that uh, Tal's case does give us an example to consider, and that is the role of conscience and of individual conscience and also collective norms. Because in this case, one of the great tensions is, is that for Tal, um, his individual conscience says, do not go, break the law if necessary. On the other hand, the argument can be made from the collective sense that in a country where the draft is the norm, um, if he doesn't serve, someone else must. And so it gets into some really challenging questions. And so I thought this might be, I wanted to, to share this as to set us up for our discussion. We'll have about 10, 15 minutes or so for discussion on this topic, but about the issue of conscientious objection in all its forms in, in Jewish context, but also just in a broader societal context. Uh, what, what inspiration might we gain from the story of Shifra and Pua? Um, and also I'm thinking again about the issue of what happens when things don't go well. It did for Shifra and Pua. That's not always the way it goes. And so like to, anyway, we'll open this up for some conversation here. I am going to turn off our recording for this part so we can talk a little more freely. But if someone can help me remember to turn back on the recording to start it back up when our discussion time is done. So, so let me share screen again. We now have our version of Osei Shalom. Would someone like to read the English side here? I'll read it. Let us make peace in the world. Let us make peace for us, for all Israel, and for all humanity. And we say, Amen. Nase shalom baholaham. Nase shalom aleinu. Ve'al kohog Yisrael. Ve'al ko yosh ve'tevel ve'noma ve'noma men. We now turn our minds and hearts towards those who need our love, who are ill, who are lonely, who suffer pain, who have been wronged. Let us pause as we call out their names. So feel free to either unmute yourself and share, share their names out loud or to uh, put their names in the chat. Uh, Greg and Catherine Hardy. Frank Mahood. We have in the chat, Mary Hartchick. May all who suffer know they are not alone. May they experience Rafua Shlema, the renewal of body and spirit. Mekom Hakoak, Betokenu, Mekorot Habraka, Meke Brotenu. May the source of strength that dwells so deep within us help us find the courage to make our lives a blessing. And let us say, Amen. And we now come to our time for the mourners, our version of the mourners' Kaddish. Are there names that anyone is remembering this morning? Larry Knight. Philip Krauss. We have in the chat Eve Smith. And Mary Hartchick. Would someone like to read the English side here? I can read it. Okay. May there be a good remembrance and compassion and kindness and love from all the world upon the names of our honorable loved ones who have passed from the world. 
Let us make a place in our hearts to remember their good names, a good memory, and let us honor them with good deeds. May their memory be a blessing forever. Amen. Amen. And now we're coming to our version of the Elenu. It is upon us to praise the beauty of the world, even as we fall and rise up, and to continue the work of repairing the world. For within us is the power to build and repair, and it is in our hands to bring about liberation. And one day humanity will be united and one in purpose. And now, if you have um, wine handy or juice or something else, go ahead and grab, grab it as we get ready for our version of the Kadush. We raise our glass the sixth day, and on the seventh day we complete the labor which we perform, and we refrain on the seventh day from all our labor, and we bless the seventh day and set it aside, for we refrain from all the labor which we have to do. And as we keep our glasses raised, Yom Hashvai Vatakal Bayom Hashvi Hamalaka Asher Neesta Vatishabot Bayom Hashvi Ko Hamalaka Asher Neesta Neverek et Yom Hashvi Ik Van Kadesh Oto Kivo Shatvan Shavat Shavatnu Mikol Hamalaka Asher Bakranu La Asot Savri, Kavarim, Vekavarot. Attention, friends, and raise our glasses some more. Barukahor, Bakahimim, Bore, Pori, Hagafen. And we all say, Amen. And Lahayam. And then, if you have some kind of bread handy this morning, let me get mine out real quick. Let us lift up our bread. Blessed are those that bring forth bread from the earth. Berukim hamotzim lakim min haretz. Amen. And Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. I'm going to stop the share screen. Just thank everyone so much for being with us today. And I especially want to just say, again, thank you for everyone being willing to engage in challenging conversation. I'm really proud of us as a community we can talk about things we can disagree we can and we can recognize each other's humanity and the values that we all share um, I have a, a, one of my favorite rabbis has said that in Jewish context so often our disagreements are not about who has Jewish principles but rather how do we prioritize how do we individually prioritize different Jewish principles and so um I just kind of leave that as a closing thought, as something for us to consider that um, and to recognize the humanity of us all. So anyway, I'm going to go ahead and turn off the recorder and we can have some time for visiting, sharing, whatever for the next little bit. And um, we'll keep the chat open, keep the Zoom open for a few for a little bit longer for anyone to continue the conversation. Also, just a reminder, uh, tomorrow is our next session of our Juda uh, Humanistic Judaism 101 class. In that session, I believe Martin is going to be talking about the question of adoption versus conversion. Why do humanistic Jews often use the phrase being adopted into Judaism and, instead of being converted? So I um, encourage you to come check that out if you can. So anyway.